All right. Well, last time I think we got a little bit closer together, <laughs> felt far apart. Um, I have, you know, many, many questions, and we're going to talk about uh, the new book, and we're going to be talking about kids and talking to parents, talking to educators, uh, and you will have a chance also to ask questions at the end. Uh, so I hope that my questions are, 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 um, are at least filling the gaps in some of the questions that you will want to ask if you don't get a chance. Uh, so I get a lot of questions from parents about how to apply the ideas in my book about presence, about uh, you know, how do you get kids to feel powerful, especially in middle school when they start to really feel sort of powerless and much more worried about what other kids think of them, right? I mean, this is an age that's so critical to these kinds of psychological issues, personality variables. So I've gotten thousands, but you've probably gotten tens or hundreds of thousands. Um, how did that shape this book? I mean, when you wrote Quiet, did you expect that you would be writing this book? Oh, gosh. Um, no. <laughs> no, I had no idea. I, I really thought that I was going to publish Quiet, you know, give a TED Talk, go on book tour, and maybe six weeks later be sitting cozily back <laughs> at my laptop working on a book on a completely different topic. Like, that had been my intention, truly, at the beginning. Good luck. And yeah. then, um, yeah. And, but then I started to hear, as you say, from so many people talking about what this meant to them. And, um, and so I knew I had to you know, do so much more work. And we can talk about all the different work that we're doing with Quiet Revolution. But specifically around this book, um, the group that I heard from the most and in the most heartfelt way was kids. It was educators. It was parents. And then it was just regular people, ages you know, 17 to 70, who were saying, if only I had heard this when I was a child. My whole entire life would have been different if I had heard the idea that I was OK the way I was. And like I, I took up just talking about it, because just think of the ridiculous amount of unnecessary uh, pain and wasted potential um, from people who didn't have this kind of a message when they were growing up. And instead, were given the message by their parents inadvertently often, you know, be more like your extroverted sibling or, you know, do this, do this, step outside your true preference of how to be yourself and spend your time. And so I really wanted to do something for kids and particularly for kids in the middle school years as you talk about because that, I mean, that's the epicenter of the difficult time for anybody growing up, right? But um, I, for introverts in particular, I think we forget, you know, when you're in school, especially at that age, it's like, the only currency on offer is the currency of how outgoing you are and how social you are, yeah. right? So like later on in life, you can, you, know, you can contribute in so many different ways, but at that age, it feels like that's the only way to contribute. And so I wanted to really give role models to these kids of like, wow, you, you are amazing the way you are. Look at this person, look at this person who did it in different ways from the script that's being handed down to you. That's just, I, I was reminded of this, I think it's a Lester Bangs quote, the only true currency in this bankrupt world is what we share with each other when we're uncool. Oh and I love, I love that, that so much. It Wait, just occurred to me. Almost famous. Yeah, it is. But I think it's a real quote, actually, okay. too. So, oh, it's a real. It's a meta quote. Okay. So, okay. Wait, I'm, I'm just doing a total digression right now. <laughs> this is what always the subject of the <laughs> evening. You know what I'm going to say. Okay. So, so Amy, Amy, um, you know, she's this Harvard business professor, but really, she's a former deadhead. And, I'm um, still a deadhead. I'm a former deadhead. <laughs> right, a current one. A current one. So one of my favorite stories about her is oh, um, no. she loves the movie Almost Famous, as do I. How many of you have seen that movie? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's this movie about, about kind of groupies in a band. It's really great. And there's this one incredible moment where everybody's on the band bus and they're together singing the Elton John song, Tiny Dancer. So Amy had this one moment in her life when <laughs> she had... Um, a band happened to be staying at her house with we, her. We often have bands who are touring stay with us. <laughs> and they asked her how they, they could repay her for her kindness. And she said, well, all I really ask is that you, all, have, your all band, I ask. you have your band bus parked in the driveway. Can we please go into the bus and all sing Tiny Dancer? <laughs> but it, wa it was not just that. And also imagine, we live in Newton, like the suburbs of, right? It was in Newton. You know, so in the tour bus, this band, all long hair, that's an Australian band, they, 
they knew that scene so well, that tiny dancer scene, that we acted it out. We even had the lines in there, you know, where he says, I have to go home. And I turn around and I go, you are home. You know, the whole thing. We've got it all recorded. It was amazing. It was like one of the best moments of my life. Oh, God. Yeah, it was great. Um, OK. So back to the regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> it's so hard to sit and be serious. Like, we're not just going to chat. Right. Uh, OK. And, and that, that, so, so, so that sort of brings me to my next question. And, and I know some of you were here uh, in January. And so I'm sorry if you're hearing this story again. But I'm, I'm assuming many of you were not. And Susan's TED Talk came out about six months before mine, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they were, you know, trending and popular at the same time. And because, I think for a number of reasons, because I was, I'm from a, a business, or I'm not from, I teach at a business school, and I use the word power. And honestly, I think because I'm blonde and she is, she's brunette, and people like to think of women in terms of Charlie's Angels, <laughs> like the different roles or something, they just somehow assumed that we would be, that we had completely opposing perspectives. Mm -hmm. That I was saying people should be, you know, charismatic and, powerful and bold and loud. And so people started tweeting things like, yeah. I would tweet something and they'd be like, I wonder what Susan Cain would think of that. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I mean, I've never met her, but God, I, like, I worship her. And I hope that she'd be OK. And I kept waiting for her to tweet back. She didn't. But eventually, we were giving a talk at the same conference and ran into, we basically ran into each other. And I think it, I, I probably threw myself onto you and embraced you. And, realized that we were saying, well, I think we knew all along the same thing, that, that you ha we've got to be OK being our authentic selves. Like, it, it has to be OK. It has to be OK. If you can't do that, you cannot be present. You can't be powerful. You can't be effective. You certainly cannot have well-being in your life. And so that brings me to um, um, my next question. Uh, about classroom participation. Wait, Would, actually, before you go there, I just yeah. want to comment on that. Because um, you know, the interesting thing is I, I do think that we both very much talk about the importance of being our authentic selves. But the funny thing is, too, that you, know, you talk in your TED Talk about fake it until you become it. And I very much believe in that at the same time that I believe in really being who you are. Um, I, like I, I don't think you can really get through this life without faking it a little bit until you become it. And so the key is kind of faking it in the right direction, you know, to, right. towards the thing that you actually want to be. Right, Fake, faking it until you become who you actually are. So yeah, if you're scared, yeah. if, if you're an introvert and you have some sense of shame about it, you need to fake not having that sense of shame until you can fully inhabit who you are. Yeah, or just faking, you know, a million things, like any number of things that come up along the way. I mean, there have been so many times all through life of like, you know, where I would think of somebody who embodied the thing that, or the way that I wanted to be in the world that I couldn't yet achieve, and I would think, okay, what would this person do? I, I, there was, I would, maybe she's here now. Her name was Peggy Davenport, and I once saw her. Um, Peggy, at a, <laughs> I once saw her at a career panel when I was in law school, and she just seemed so lovely and full of grace and passion for what she was doing. So for the next five years, anytime I felt uncertain, I would think, what would Peggy Davenport do? And I think that those moments, you know, they really matter. I, like, I don't think I could have given a TED but, Talk without but that But it was principle. because you, so I mean, you identified with her, right? I mean, you, you, it, it wasn't that you were like, she is so different from me, yes. I want to be a completely different person. Yeah, that is the thing. And that's, again, you know, why I really wanted like, to put so many role models, for example, into this book, because I think you need examples of the, of the person you could become. But you wanted to talk about class participation. Well, there's so many things. But um, yeah, so, so the funny thing is that part of why I got started doing the research that I do is because I teach at this place where classroom participation is half the grade. And it's not just that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's intense. I mean, it's, it's like in between classes, you hear the students in the, in the hallway saying things like, did you get airtime? I mean, they're fighting for time. Yeah. And it's not just time. Like, it's got to be a high quality comment. They've got to you know, sort of convey this, this conviction, and it's also got to be sort of provocative. It's really, really hard to do. I don't know if you know this, but, you know, I did a section of, of, of course the adult book. Of course I know no, no, I know that. Following, I know you know that, but I did a section of the, <laughs> of the adult book on Harvard Business School, and I kind of 
plopped myself down there for like a week or two and just interviewed the students and listened to all the conversations. It's the most fascinating place anthropologically that I've ever visited, yes. really. It's, it's, it's kind of amazing. It's but the reason I went the there in the first place is because I had a friend who had graduated and he said to me, you're writing this book? It, HBS is the spiritual capital of extroversion. Yes. That's where you have to go. Ooh, that's, yeah, that's... And yeah, the class participation <laughs> thing was really intense. It is intense. and, Cause, and cause it's social capital. It's not, 50% of the right. grade is participation, that's right. but it's also social capital. So when we were trying to figure out things like um, um, gender grade gaps, yeah. which had so much to do, it turned out, with, with participation, uh, because it has to do, gender has to do with power, and power influences who participates. Um, but one of the things that, that we, we asked students, the, the, that HBS asked the students was, when they participated, who were they thinking, uh, like who were they, who were they speaking to? Like who were they worried about? It wasn't the professor. The professor was like number four. Yeah. Like chairs were before the professor. <laughs> it, was each, it was each other. Yeah. It was yeah. each other. It yeah. wasn't the grade. Yeah. It was the social capital that they get from that. And you know, they're in this intense, yeah, strange place. But, I wanted to help people get through that experience, even and 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 I think at first I thought, well, they better learn how to do this because you have to do this in life, and maybe that was sort of the party line. Mm -hmm. But the more, the longer I've been there, and the more I've spent time with these students in my office or out of the classroom, and I've seen how incredibly bright and curious and wonderful these quiet students are, the more I feel like this is not quite the right model. Mm -hmm. What do we do about this? So, I mean, I know HBS is an extreme case, but it's, I mean, ev everywhere in schools, I mean, oh, for yeah, the most yeah, part, yeah. in mainstream yeah. schools, participation is really highly valued. Yeah. Um, no, and it's creeping Where do we in, go? Right, it is creeping into the way uh, regular school is being taught also. And I think the pro you know, it's, it's a problem not only from the point of view of, well, there are students who are uncomfortable with it, whether for reasons of personality or gender or culture or what have you, it's also, it's really, um, it's, it's promoting a, a very shallow discourse yeah. in culture in general. I mean, I, I remember talking to a student at HBS who told me, you know, I really like to speak when I have something to say, but I find myself just sitting around and like cooking up something to say exactly. just for the sake of having the airtime. And that's really the culture that we're promoting right now. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's funny, I remember for my book, the first book, interviewing a young woman who had come to this country from, uh, Shanghai, and she was actually a very innately extroverted person, very like outgoing, jolly, extroverted person, but had been raised with cultural norms in the classroom where you don't participate. She said, she said, I couldn't believe it, and in the American classroom, all you have to do is talk nonsense, and the professor <laughs> nods respectfully and is very happy, and everybody <gasps> thinks it's great, and, and she said, you know, from where she had come, it was the opposite, that it would be seen as rude to be taking up other people's time with your nonsense. Um, so, uh, you know, and you turn on the cable news channel and we all say, well, why, why do we have this shallow discourse? Well, so, this is baked into our system. So, like, in terms of what to do about it, I mean, there's a few things, and, and we're working on all of them with Quiet Schools Network, which I'll tell you about later, but, um, you know, I think we need to move from a model of classroom participation to classroom engagement, which recognizes that there are is a broader, more holistic way to engage with materials besides yeah. just doing this the whole time. You know, there's listening, um, there's writing about material, there's talking quietly with your classmates before or after class. There's any number of things you can do. Um, and I also think that it would be really interesting to, in, in lower schools in particular and, and secondary schools, to be separating out the grades that test your knowledge of the material from the grades that test the other stuff. Because it makes no sense to assess someone's knowledge of history or trigonometry based on how much they're doing this. Um, and, all, and then, once you separate out the other stuff, yes, of course it's important to be able to be vocally active. That's a skill we all need, of course. Um, but you start realizing there's a lot of other non-academic skills that matter too, like character and citizenship and listening skills and any number of things. And you start, when you, when, you shot, when you separate it out, you start realizing how strange it is that we're so privileging vocal uh, acuity over all these other topics. I'm not even sure if it's acuity, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, but, uh, yeah. And, and, and actually, I mean, even in the business school, we're learning that those qualities are 
really the best predictors of which teams function well and sort of rise to the top. So that the qualities the, of character. And exactly, so and, and social yeah. awareness and self-awareness right. and the ability right. to listen and actually not be talking all the time. Yeah. You know, yeah. not a team full of alphas. Right, um, right. Yeah, and you know, it's funny, because, and, and I, I believe that in this world we all need to kind of modify our more extreme tendencies, right? And, and it's not just about introversion, extroversion, but, you know, any number of our traits. Um, so anyway, I, you know, I think of Sheryl Sandberg, who, who is a very vocal alpha type of person. She actually hired a coach at one point to help her speak less in meetings because she felt she was dominating too much and it was meaning that other people's voices weren't being heard and they were walking away with good ideas not having come to the fore. So, you know, balance. That's, un yeah, that's nice to hear and unusual. Yeah. Um, are you extrovert bashing? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I mean, our friend. I mean, I'm no, kidding. I know, I know that you get asked that question, and I think it's yeah. important to talk about that a bit. It's totally important because I do get it a lot, and I, you know, and I think it kind of it mirrors what happened with the early days of the women's movement, where there was kind of a suspicion that if you were talking about empowering women, you must be talking parallel. about bashing men, right? It's like, so true. It had to be like this. It was a very zero-sum outlook yeah. on the world. Whereas I think now we're at a much more sophisticated place and most people don't think that and we just think, okay, you know, let's raise everybody up. And so the same thing is true with introverts and extroverts. Um, who, and especially, well, I guess it's the same as with masculine and feminine, but um, there's really a yin and yang there between these two personality styles. And that's the reason we're such close friends, right? Because we've got that. Um, I have many close friends. My husband oh, is an extrovert. I want to say this other thing. I'm sorry? Nothing, I was kidding. And, Making um, a joke. <laughs> I was interrupting. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's, it's so not about bashing extroverts. And in fact, like, a lot of the work that we're doing is it's not only about you know, raising up introverts, but it's about promoting respect between the two and making discourse commonplace, we're making it just commonplace for people to sit around and talk about this. So you're in a classroom and like making it, okay, the kids talk to each other about what they feel like and how they like to spend their time. Like I'm thinking of one girl who we interviewed for this book who really liked to go to the, the library every day at lunchtime at school and just chill out and read and recharge her energy. And one time a delegation of her best friends came and said to her, why are you doing this? You don't like us. Um, you, you must not like us if you're behaving this way. And she tried to explain it to them, but they didn't really understand it, and they, they gave her an ultimatum. Like, either you spend lunchtime with us, or you can't be in our group anymore. And, you know, that's just one story, but that's like what happens all the time. So now, instead, imagine a world where, where, where kids, where students just talk about this as part of their everyday chit-chat these misunderstandings wouldn't happen in the first place and people would be able to grant each other a little more slack like they'd give her the time she needs and she would also be able to give them what they need right because you know the extroverts really need their friends to check in with them maybe more often than would come naturally to that girl and you bend a little i feel like that is beginning to happen right like the, the, i mean one of the things that i noticed um is that when i started teaching at, at hps eight years ago no one would admit that they're an introvert. Yeah. Like if you did a personality assessment, n people, nobody would raise their hand. Now they're like, well, I'm actually kind of an introvert. <laughs> like it's actually got some capital, right? Like to say, oh, it's actually kind of <laughs> cool to say that you're an introvert. And uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm sure that we're gonna, uh, that, that's partly because they've already your book and, the, and, and, the, and you're, you're telling them that introverts can be great leaders. And they're like, actually I have those qualities <laughs> too, which is really wonderful. Um, that, that, that they see it that way, but it is interesting. I mean, I, that, I feel like whenever I talk about gender um, and I talk about how important it is for us to teach our daughters that they can expand and take up space in the world and be powerful, I, I feel like I also have to say I am not, and I, I have only one child and he's, it's a boy. Mm -hmm. I am yeah. not saying that I want my son to contract and take up less space. Right. I don't want him to, I'm, I'm so glad that they're getting that message. I just want the girls to get that message too. But it is interesting how you get that. You have to sort of immediately go, I'm not bashing the other. Right. I'm right. just saying this one maybe gets less attention and we need to pay, pay more attention to it. Yeah, um, yeah. And some of that I think is just being careful with language to make sure that you know, we're communicating the message correctly so people don't get the wrong impression. Right. Yeah. 
Wait, I'm, I'm gonna say something your comment made me think about. It's actually a different point, but okay. um, in terms of raising girls, I think a really tricky issue that we need to grapple with right now is we have so much work to do with undoing all the decades, centuries really, of girls and women being taught not to take up space and yes. to be docile and to be quiet. Okay, so now it's happening. You know, I've been to many sort of leadership development programs for girls, for women, and the girls are now sent the message, you know, be loud, be bold, be proud. And the introverts in the room are thinking, I can't do that, like that's not who I am. So now they're feeling like, well, I'm, I don't belong over here and I don't belong over here, so where, where do I go exactly? So I, I think that when it comes to feminism and especially for young girls, we've got to modify that message too. Or modify is probably the wrong word, but make it more subtle so that it applies to, to all types. And I mean, I think boys get that message all the time, right? Mm -hmm. That they're supposed yeah, to be bold true. and decisive yeah. and strong. And yeah. you know, that's one of, the, one of the issues that makes women think that they're the only ones who feel like imposters or the only ones that have insecurities because men are told that they can't talk about it. That's so true. I think you have this, yeah. this issue for, for boys as, as well, although it might even be, be older. And I, I, wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about, um, a little bit more about our kids in school and their social lives, which are so important to their development and, yeah. and really the things that, that, that probably most contribute to their sense of well-being yeah. when they're you know, 12, 13, I don't know, 18, all of those years. Um, can you be class president and be an introvert? Yeah, um, if that's what you wanna do, then yes, you can. Um, and I, I'm really careful to preface it with if that's what you wanna do because What's happening right now in our school culture is there is such a, um, there's such an emphasis on leadership that again, everybody thinks they've gotta be a leader in the traditional sense of the word, um, even those who don't have an interest in that kind of thing, right? And so I think we, we've gotta really um, make sure people understand, our kids understand that there are many different ways in this life to be a leader. Um, but that said, there are some quieter kids who really do want that more, you know, conventional, for lack of a better word, mode of leadership. Um, there's one amazing guy who I wrote about in, in, in this book, and he, by his own description, um, he was a very shy, awkward, nerdy kid. Um, he was the only Asian American in a school, it was, it was all white kids, so, uh, that was it. And so he was very much like the other in a million ways. And he decided he wanted to run for president and he was running against one of the most popular girls in the school. And the way he did it, this girl went around, as you might expect, making her speeches to the homerooms, um, talking about all the parties that she was gonna throw as president. <laughs> and he instead, he did his kind of introvert thing. He drew on his natural strengths. And so he, he thought really deeply and carefully about what was wrong with the school and how he could make it better. And he gave speeches that were all about that substantive thought that he had done, and he ended up being elected president. Yeah, he did it. <laughs> and uh, um, his, his name is Davis Wynn, by the way. He uh, graduated from Yale last year. He's, uh, maybe some of you know him. He, he, he is continuing still with that path. Um, he's a quiet leader. I'm sure you're gonna be hearing more about him. And, and more quiet leaders. Oh yeah, absolutely. And well, I mean, you know what? I'm gonna give you one more example of a, an introverted class president because this one achieved it in a different way. Um, this was a guy by the name of Jake Millman who um, was the class president at Harris Mann, I think it was for four years in a row. Very introverted guy and lovely, lovely young man. He had a very close friend who was an extrovert, yin and yang and they ran for president together. I guess at Harris Mann, that's how it works. You have co-presidents. Okay. And so together, you know, greater than the sum of their two parts. And so that's another model that I think oh, we don't really pay enough attention to for our kids. But if you look, you know, in the grown-up world, in the business world, like you often see that many successful operations derive their su success from people arranging themselves, whether consciously or not, in these yin-yang -yang pairings. Like at Facebook, you have Sheryl Sandberg, but you have Mark Zuckerberg, you know, very introverted CEO. And so I think that's something I wish uh, we'd pay more attention to. One of the things that I, that I, you know, that I liked, I, I, many things I love about the book, but 
So the things that I love about the work that you've done, and I think that, that the reason why your book has been d just so in incredibly important culturally, mm -hmm. is that it it turned a lot of our cultural norms upside down and made us go, wait a minute, why do I accept that as, wh wh why? Yeah, yeah. Um, and one of them is that I, I feel like we sort of teach kids, teach each other, you know, I mean, any kind of like women's magazine, any kind of, how to go to parties and meet people, how to network, you know, how do you go to a party and make conversation? And there was something in your book about that was, that was labeled how to leave a party. <laughs> and I loved that. And I'm yeah. wondering, and, I, and I, it's just so like, of course you should be able to do that. Yeah. Um, can you just talk about that a little, just, just that, I mean, just generally the idea that maybe you wanna go and that's also okay. Yeah. Um, and how, how do you do that? Yeah, well, I mean, this was inspired by so many experiences, but one is a friend of mine, actually, who, who I've noticed over the years, accepts pretty much every single party invitation and leaves after an hour and 18 minutes, like almost on cue. <laughs> and, and she always excuses herself very graciously. I don't even think anyone else realizes she does it. I just do, because this is kind of my thing, you know, so I notice it. Um, but she just, you know, because she owns it and feels entitled to do it and does it graciously, no one cares. No one cares. You know, so she, she, doesn't, doesn't, she doesn't have to say there's an emergency. Or no, I'm no, she just says, she okay, just it's time to go. Thank you so much. It was so lovely to be here, you know, and that's it. Um, I, I, I think in general, when you're operating out of a place of this is okay and I have the conviction that what I'm doing is okay, that that communicates itself and kind of paves a path for you through the world. And that's why I think so much of, you know, what's important about this kind of work is not even, you know, remembering this tip or that tip, but it's more kind of taking in the whole world view that yeah. it's okay to be who you are and operating from that. Um, I mean, I, God, for kids, I, I wrote about this in, in, in the book. I remember some friends of mine throwing me a, a birthday party when I was in high school and I don't know, they invited like eight of my closest friends or something. And it was so nice, <laughs> it was this really nice party. It was so kind of them to do it. And I spent the whole time feeling bad, thinking if this were someone else's party, there would be 75 people here oh. and I only have eight. And it's so crazy, because you know, now as an adult, I don't think anything of having a very small birthday party. Like, I, I don't think it would have, I mean, how many of you want to celebrate your birthday with 75 people? Like, some of the time, but a lot of the time, no, and you don't think twice about it. But as a kid, there are these very rigid social expectations that it would be great to free kids from. Can we talk a little bit about, you know, your childhood? Sure, <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about your childhood. <laughs> um, but how, yeah, can, can you talk about sort of, were there, were there pi sort of pivotal moments for you when you understood this about yourself, did you think of yourself? Did you label yourself an introvert? Did you feel okay being who you were? Did you feel, I mean, I, you gave us one example of not feeling okay. Right. But, right. but generally, where were you? Were, were you like, this is who I am and that's okay? Or there's something different or wrong? How, how was it for you? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of a mix for me. So first of all, I did not Label. I didn't know the word introvert, I think, until I was in my 30s, actually. So, you know, a lot of it is just giving a language, which is actually, I, I have to say, a little bit tricky because kids are still forming, so you don't want to make them feel there's one word that defines me, so that has to be handled, I think, carefully. Um, but, but, still, but I was aware of this since I was four years old. I've been thinking about this, for sure. Um, you know, I remember being in, in summer camp at age four, and, feel, and I've always been somebody who liked to have lots of friends who I played with one-on-one. -on -one. You know, I'm still that way to this day. And I remember being in camp and wanting to play with my friends that way and just continually being hauled into these loud group sing-alongs and things. And, thinking, and, and I, I just remember being sort of more mystified than anything else. It's like, why, why exactly are we doing this? <laughs> but, and, but for me, I, I think I kind of emotionally teetered between feeling I'm comfortable in my own skin for this reason, because you know, you're sent so many messages to be the other way. Um, but I also, I did have the good fortune in two ways. One, I came from a, a quiet family, like a family that loved above all else to read. You know, so my way of being was completely natural within my family. Um, and it is also true that most writers 
and especially writers of children's fiction are introverts. And so that means many protagonists of children's fiction mm -hmm. are introverts. They're not described that way, but that's what they are. Yeah. So I was continually, I, I was always seeing versions of myself in these, these very characters. cool protagonists. Yeah, and those worlds were so important to me as a reader that I had always that model of, of, of that coolness. What, what would have happened if you had known that, you know, a third of the kids we're also going, why are we doing this dumb thing along? This is crazy. Yeah. I mean, would it have, so I guess the thing that I'm struggling with, and you sort of alluded to it, is we always, as psychologists, we always are concerned about labeling people, yeah. right? For yeah. a variety of reasons. You cre create intergroup situations. Um, they feel like that's their whole identity. Yeah, how do we talk to kids about introversion mm -hmm. without making them feel that that is their central identity or, um, uh, so so we, we want them to know that many other people feel the way they feel. Yeah. I don't know, what, yeah. what, like, just around language, how do we talk to kids about this? How do parents do it? How do teachers do it? Yeah, I think it should just be, we have to get to the point where it's really no big deal. It, yeah. Because it is no yeah. big deal, you know? And just, you can use the word introvert or not use the word introvert. That, that almost doesn't matter. You just have to talk about the thing itself. Because, um, yeah, first of all, to answer your question, it would have been completely different had I known I wasn't the only one. And I am not the, I, I know I'm not the only one saying this because letter after letter after reader letter that I get tells me, oh my God, I thought I was the only one. I had no idea, I had no idea that so many others felt this way. You know, even in college, I remember like really wishing that at mealtime that I could sometimes just like sit by myself with a newspaper and eat a tuna fish sandwich. And yeah, but there was like this, imperative that you had to be sitting at these long tables like recounting the drinking games from the previous weekend God. and it's awful. And, and and i and like it would have been great to know that other people felt that way yeah um so yeah I, you know I, I think parents should be introducing this stuff again in a no big deal way with their kids like oh i noticed you felt uncomfortable at that party you know i often feel that way here's what i do when that happens um and some people feel that way more than others Fine, like you wanna communicate, no big deal. Okay, so do we even use the labels at all or do we talk about behaviors? Uh, I think that's a tricky thing and it depends on the child and the stage. I think it's useful to talk about the labels um, as long as people, as long as the kids also understand that there is a lot of fluidity within, within these labels because the labels are incredibly, um, instructive, right? And there's fluidity at the same time. Right. Um, you know, and so even saying, like, there's no such thing as a pure introvert or a pure extrovert. A any psychologist would say that that thing right. does not exist. Right. So sometimes you're gonna feel more introverted, sometimes you're gonna feel more extroverted. Some people are farther along this, this spectrum than others. It's all good. Okay. Okay. There's yeah. so much that I wanna ask. Um, I wanna ask, because I'm not sure that anyone will, will ask this question, but, and I know you just, you know, you, you've written now two books on this, and it's frustrating when people ask questions like this, so I, I apologize. I coming. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite song? No. Well, if you, if you had, if you, if you had, what are the most important, to, it, yeah. Please don't not read the book because I'm, she might tell you the most important takeaways. That doesn't mean the rest of the book is not important. But if you had to share some of the really most important messages for parents and teachers, mm -hmm. really, parents, what would they be? I mean, what are the things you most want them to understand about their kids? Right, right. I mean, well, the most important takeaway really is an emotional and psychological one, and it's just, you know, you have permission to be who you are. So just like let go of all the worries that you're supposed to be different, done. Um, but in terms of like actual, you know, things you could do differently, let's say for parents, um, one is, well, we all know that we have this terrible problem of the overscheduled childhood and this affects all children yeah. now, but it affects introverts especially who often, you know, they're in school all day long. So school is like, and, yeah. and school all day is party. social, right? Yeah, it's I know, an all day people party. forget. Like, yes, you're learning, but it's social. It's completely social, yeah. yeah. And so for a lot of these kids, they really want to come home and chill and recharge. Yeah. And that's okay. Okay. Um, so you don't 
and, and listen to them and talk to them and find out what activities do they want to schedule. And, and sometimes they're going to tell you maybe that they don't want a certain activity, and they might actually like the activity if they could partake in it after having had a chance to chill, because what they really might be resisting is just the constant back-to-back -back on this. Um, another thing I'd say is to help your child step outside their comfort zone, um, but to make sure that you're doing it with respect for how long it can take for sh more shy or introverted children to get to a place of comfort. Um, I often say these kids have a much longer runway that they have to travel down before they take off and fly, but they will fly, but it's gonna take them longer. So a good rule of thumb is to think of, of discomfort levels on a scale of one to 10. And you don't want your child in the eight to 10 zone. Like that's probably too much. It's gonna be overwhelming. It could backfire but you want them more in the four to six zone where they're stretching, but it's still comfortable. <laughs> Another sort of personal story. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so we spend a lot of holidays together and we've been spending Christmases together, although Susan is so um, polite that she didn't tell us till the second Christmas together that they don't actually really celebrate Christmas. <laughs> so we wrote all these Christmas presents and they're like, thank you so much oh, for the that's gifts. Oh, we loved it though. The next year we got a big Christmas tree. It was very fun. I know, it's great, you got presents. Yeah, no, like, I don't want you to stop doing it's it. It's awesome, I love it. right. <laughs> but that year, we, um, we were in a little, a little mountain town and I was writing and and you know you're kind of always writing and I we discovered this kind of strange thing which which is that she can work in a coffee shop and write mm -hmm. and have lots of talking around her and be completely non-distractible I don't understand it I cannot do that I like being in coffee shops I like the quiet buzz in the background but like if if I hear a person talking, I can't, I have to tune into all these things. Yeah. And it made me think, my, my first reaction was, oh, maybe you're an extrovert. You need to be around people and I'm the introvert. But actually, no, yeah. it's because I'm so tuned in to people that it's very hard for me to tune that out. And I think yeah. um, you don't necessarily, I mean, you are tuned into people, but in that setting where there are people you don't know and there's this buzz going on, you can tune it out. But what is it that you like about that? Like, why do you like, like, no, I love it, but like, why, why do you like, why, like, why is it easier to work in a coffee shop with people around than work alone? I mean, cause I think this is sort of a stereotype. The introvert like goes to their cottage in the woods yeah, alone yeah. by a creek <laughs> and they don't talk to people and their fire is burning and the dog is on the rug and you know, and you, you like to have people around. Yeah, yeah. What is, I know, it's so funny cause I, I wrote most of the first book, Quiet, in this amazing cafe in Greenwich Village uh, called Doma, which tragically doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, wasn't it great? Um, and my husband used to come and visit me there, and he would say, I couldn't even write a postcard here. Like, how are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> and I loved it so, so much. I don't know. I, you know I, I it's because they don't serve pina coladas. <laughs> and I was like, what? where are the pina coladas? <laughs> sure he was. Um, I don't know. I just think that... It's kind of like New York City writ large. So I love New York. There's a stereotype often also that introverts wouldn't like New York City. And right. so New York City is amazing because you have all these people around, but you also have so much anonymity. So you can feel the energy of other right. people and the connection with them. Um, but you also know that you can like go into your own flow space, which I the place yeah. that, which is a place I really love to be. So kind of. But I'm, but it really is tuning into the other so into the energy because. It's not like any cafe would work. Like it has to be a cafe of like-minded people, even if I'm never gonna talk to them, I just feel their vibes. Okay, okay. You know? <laughs> I get it, I get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Um, all right, I wanna ask you about some of the work that you're doing kind of more broadly, the Quiet Schools Network. Can you mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, this sure. This is so um, important. I'm really, really excited about it. Um, so the Quiet Schools Network, uh, we are launching this June and we are uh, working, starting this June, a year-long program with our first cohort of 50 educators from schools all over the country, uh, working with them to help them kind of understand introversion and extroversion better, harness the talents of the quieter students in their schools, um, give them techniques as teachers for uh, you know, uh, drawing out participation uh, from the introverted students in a way that is actually working for them. Uh, you know, all across the board, all kinds of stuff. And I will say too, the, the Quiet Schools Network is led by Heidi Kasevich, who I can't see anything because of the, She's there good. she is. Okay, so Heidi, 
Heidi's like an amazing human being. And um, we actually were doing so much stuff at Quiet Revolution that we had always wanted to do the Quiet Schools Network, but we had been thinking it was something we were going to do in a year or two because we were already so full up with projects. And then we met Heidi, and we were like, oh my gosh, perfect person. We have to make this happen. So um, Heidi is a former educator and quiet revolutionary who is ably leading the charge. And it's really exciting. Where do people go to find out more? Um, you can come to our website at quietrev.com for quiet revolution and go to look for Quiet Schools Network or look for the contact form and just get in touch with us um, if you want to find out more. So, so some students have told me about teachers who have talked to them about their own nature. In fact, there's one, there's one uh, girl who we interviewed in the book who kind of screwed up the courage to go and talk to her teacher about the ways in which the class participation requirements in the classroom weren't working for her. And the teacher ended up telling her that he was an extrovert also. I'm, I'm sorry, that he was an introvert also. <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. no. <laughs> That's yeah. not good. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so they develop this great connection with each other, and that goes such a long way. Okay, okay. Uh, um, also, I want to ask you about the Quiet Power Clubs. Yes. Um, so the Quiet Power Clubs are on the drawing board and soon to be inaugurated, and basically these are going to be clubs for uh, start, starting with middle school students and ultimately high school students too, um, where the students together can form their own clubs and talk about the issues that they want to tackle and advocate for themselves. And we're going to be helping them and giving them the, the materials to do what they need to do. OK. I'm going to start asking some audience questions, but I need to just quickly look at these, OK? Yeah, sure. All right. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you touched, you touched on this earlier, but I want to talk. I, I'm going to ask this anyway, because I think we should dig into this a little bit more. How do we differentiate introversion from gendered apologizing for participating? Um, mm -hmm. Girls beginning their sentences with, I'm sorry, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's a double standard when girls speak up versus when boys speak up. Girls are sometimes faced to be inauthentic, or forced to be unauthentic, inauthentic um, with forced introversion. Yeah, I know. This stuff is so incredibly complicated. <laughs> it's true. You know, because girls are also forced to be cheerleaders and like rah rah right. happy for everyone, right? So yeah, this. yeah, and it just depends on the different the, the context yeah. and how you're supposed to act in each context. And but in general, like in something like a classroom or later on in a business setting, we know that for girls there's this very narrow channel that you have to surf between being not too docile, not too aggressive, and you know you can kind of walk a tightrope yeah. over here. Um, so yeah, I, I have sometimes given talks where afterwards extroverted women will come up to me and tell me, you know, very extroverted women, that they feel the exact mirror image problem. Okay. So yeah, I think it's yeah, right, incredibly that's right. complex. But what yeah. about, yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, well, we and can I, go I, on. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll say also that for, for women who are either introverts or who are extroverts who have been socialized to do the gender apologizing thing, often the same techniques can be helpful, even if it's coming from a very different place. You know, in one, in one, uh, in, in one case cultural, and in another, another case it's personality. Um, but like for example, a technique that I had developed in my own life is always in a kind of scary meeting type of situation, giving myself a push to speak up early, even mm -hmm. though that feels not natural, right? But if you're one of the early speakers, people start directing their attention towards you, and you start to feel like you're really present right. in the room. This right. is going you're to engaged. your work. Yep. Yeah, and whereas if you wait too long to speak up, you know, the opposite happens, and you feel emotionally more and more on the margins. So that's the kind of technique that's useful, whether it's personality or culture that is driving you to have the discomfort. I was thinking, I mean, but, and there are huge cultural differences too, mm -hmm. but, but I was yeah. thinking too, and I saw, I saw a paper recently on how, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the details, but it was, it was about how we, we've pathologized um, making comments like, um, I feel that, yeah, and it, right. we're supposed to cut off the I feel that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's okay to say that. 
right? So, so we've also pathologized the, the so, so it's, you know, I don't know that maybe apologizing for the way you feel is different, right. but there's still the, the, like, you can't just assert everything um, with, with total conviction. I mean, you are saying, you know, this is my perspective, and I think sometimes it's okay to say it that way. I know. And I, because I, you're acknowledging that you might not feel that way. I so agree with this. I think there really is, we, we've all now decided that the right way of assertive discourse is really a quite masculine way. Right. Um, so, you know, it comes up also with the injunction that you shouldn't say just, like you shouldn't say, I just want to know if yeah, such and that's such. That's another one. Um, but I, you know, I, I think often women put just in, not out of apology, but out of wanting to make the other person feel better. Yes. It's, it's a kind of empathy or a kind of like caretaking of the other person. Right. Which I think is, you know, we should be preserving more of. Yeah. So yeah. Right. So it's not, really I, I don't have the only opinion that exists in the world. I'm acknowledging that other people might have yeah, other opinions. Exactly, um, exactly. And you know, I'll, I'll tell you the mirror image of that on the personality side of things that I often talk about. Um, I have found that shyness is even more stigmatized than introversion yeah. is, you know, shyness being like the fear of social judgment. And I think this is such a big mistake that we're making in an ever more narcissistic society. Because if you think of what shyness is, it's like you care so much about what another right. person thinks that you're granting them the power, perhaps too much power, but the power to yeah. alter how you're feeling. Yeah. But it stems from caring what the other person of thinks. Of course. And so we should be preserving more of that. Yeah, I've been, you know, I talk about how, I mean, the, so many of our biggest challenges are about fear of social judgment. Yeah. But part of, we fear, the, we fear the social judgment because we care so much about whatever it is we're doing, about that, I mean, we, maybe we really identify with that domain or we really care about these people, right? So some of the highest stakes challenges for people are actually interpersonal challenges with people who they love. Mm -hmm. We can't tell them, don't, don't care about what you what 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 that person thinks of you. So right. it's not about being fearless. It's about sort of pushing through that fear so that you can actually communicate. Yeah. But I yeah. and we've talked about yeah. this difference no, between fearlessness and courage. Yeah. Which right. I think is really important. Yes. Can we just generally. spell it out? Like that, that, that the idea is that courage is not about being fearless. Courage is about having tons of fear and acting anyway. Right. That's what it so is. so exactly. And 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 so I I I, I had. To, we were talking about sort of some of the women writing in nonfiction mm -hmm. who've all kind of become friends and gotten to know each other a bit, like you know, Susan and me and Brene Brown and Liz Gilbert and Cheryl Strayed and all of these people. And the message is actually kind of similar, which is not about fearlessness. It's not you should be like a man. It's actually uh, you should be like the stereotype of man. It is, of course you're afraid, mm -hmm. but you're going to have moments when you can push through it yeah. and just, you know, have those moments and be okay with the moments when you're just afraid. Yeah. Right? You've and by the way, okay and, and as you're between. saying, no man is fearless either. Exactly. The, ster like, the stereotype, the stereotype, of, uh, which again is a burden on men. It's such a burden well. on men. So I'm curious, has the following thing happened to you, which is, you know, because I, I write and speak all the time about social insecurity, basically, like in one way or another, yeah. what happens is that people come up to me and tell me about insecurities that they feel that they they don't normally share and so what i have come to know is that the most you know apparently confident intimidating looking men like they're all full oh. of shyness oh yeah <laughs> they really no, are I mean, I, the first person who came up to me after my ted talk yeah was a, a guy perfectly dressed you know like mid 50s who said he said i am a swiss banker and i thought really <laughs> like you there really are Swiss bankers, right? Like, and, he, and he said, and I feel like an imposter every day when I go to work. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, wow. I mean, yeah. and when I tell people that I hear from uh, equally from men and women about their fears, people don't believe me. And I, I'm often asked to do these pieces on gender, and it will be a female journalist saying, yeah, 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 but why, why are women not confident? I'm like, they're not less confident than men. They actually are not. The data really are pretty clear. They're not less confident than men. They don't have more imposterism than men. Like, right. But if they did, what would you tell them? Like, <laughs> can't we just send a different message here that's better actually for women and men? Yeah. All right, I'm going to go on to another question. Um, to what extent would you advise being open about your introversion in the workplace, mm -hmm. especially with your boss? For example, if you need more time to prepare for a presentation and your boss interprets this as an issue of intelligence, 
instead of not realizing that you're introverted, what is the best way to explain your preferences and needs? Right, um, okay, so I mean, I hope we get to the day where you don't even have to ask this question because it's just part of everyday discourse, but we're not there yet in most places. Um, so, I, you know, I think you really have to judge who that person is, that particular boss who you're talking to and how receptive they are to these kinds of discussions and this kind of language and, and have the discussion accordingly. Um, so if it's somebody who you think is open to talking about it in this light, then do that. And otherwise, you can find other ways of talking about it. Just like, you know, I really ace my presentations when I, um, when I take the time to prepare. And you, know, you can talk about your role models of great presenters who do it this way and how you learned in their footsteps. Okay. You know, so you, if, if you need a more power-based way of talking about it, then just use the language of power. Oh, here's a good one. They were, sorry, the, the, the others were good too. <laughs> How can extroverts best support introverts in work and life? Smiley. P.S. You both are awesome. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I think it's the same way introverts can best support extroverts, really. It's just like talking about what your needs are in a given situation. Um, and it could be anything. Uh, you know, I'll give you like one really, it's kind of a mundane example, but I'm going to give it as a way of showing how much this just affects every aspect of life. So my husband and I, for years really, we had this ridiculous argument. Every time we were driving in a car, he would turn up the music and I would turn it down. He would turn it up and I would turn it down. And it was like, and I, you know, I was working on quiet all these years, but it didn't occur to either of us that this was just like our differing temperaments. And somehow having the language for that made it easier to talk about and laugh about the whole thing. Um, so yeah, it's just like, what do you need? What do you need? Yeah. And being yeah. okay. I mean, yeah. it's, when we spend time together, mm -hmm. um, I, I realize that you, like, when, when you are being alone and, and, you know, you sort of, you know, go read or whatever it is you're doing, I don't really know, but <laughs> it, I don't feel hurt by that at all. Mm -hmm. And I think if I didn't, if, if we didn't have a language for this and we hadn't yeah. talked about it and I didn't know, I would have felt like, oh my gosh, we're on vacation together and she doesn't want to be with me and, and who do I hang out with? But I really understand it. I don't take it, so I think it's not personal. Right, so, it's, so the extrovert trying to pull you in mm -hmm. is not, uh, it's, it's, it's maybe being thoughtless, but it's not personal. No, no, right? no. It's not saying I, there's something wrong with you because you're not being pulled in. And, and when you say, hey, I need some quiet time, it's fine. It's yeah. not about you. I would need it no matter who I was with. But it's funny, I mean, it's such a good example, really, because even in a situation like that, like if I want to go off and read or something, I always, there's a part of me that feels bad about it because I know how it can be misconstrued and I don't want to make someone feel that way. Um, so even, I mean, it's worth saying that I think even with us, where I think we have the kind of relationship where we can talk about things and we have this language, even there, it enters both of our heads, right? Yeah. So now think, okay, now imagine you're talking about 11-year-olds right. who lack both the language and right, like, the <laughs> confidence true. To, to have those discussions. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's like the help we need to give them. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry, but in my opinion, I think I might have felt at one time, no. Um, okay. Mm. For someone... <laughs> this is feeling like we're playing Trivial Pursuit or something. I know. <laughs> I'm trying to something, I'm not. Um, for someone who read Quiet, but not your second book yet, mm -hmm. why is middle school the source of this hindsight of regret? for not understanding your principles earlier? And what is the correct response for coming to understand them later in life? Um, well, I guess it's really what we were talking about earlier of middle school being a social crucible in general, and in particular, a place where, I mean, I, I remember this when I first got to middle school. I had come from this very kind of cozy, private school up through sixth grade. I had known everybody, it was all good. And, and, and then I went to a different, like a gigantic middle school and not knowing a soul. And so I went there, you know, kind of feeling a little bit like an anthropologist. I'm <laughs> like, where am I? I must decode these new, you know, social rituals. Um, and I remember being so puzzled that the highest accolade in school was to be called outgoing. Oh, 
Like it was, it was more important than any other attribute. It was. I right? mean, I, at least in high school, for like that, that was the best superlative, yeah. most outgoing. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's so bad. Yeah. So, <laughs> so bad. I mean, it is great to be outgoing. It's just that it's great to be any number of things. But somehow in middle school, that's the one thing that is so prized. Were you, did, were you like a superlative? Did you get a most something in high school? We didn't, thank goodness, have that in no. my high school. Like in the yearbook, we, we didn't have that one. I got were mo you? most dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> I love and I had like a sign in the yearbook that said like, Hollywood or bust. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. There was a, yeah. There was one for me and I was sort of avoiding it. Um, I gotta read it first. Mm. Okay, the question is, so I do all this work with, with US companies and, and, um, and it's well published, and, and, but I have this thesis, well it says fake it till you make it, but it's, it's really quite different, it's fake it till you become it, but the question is how does it translate internationally? Uh, how do other cultures or ethnic pockets receive this message? Um, and so, First of all, I mean, fake it till you make it is definitely an American saying. So, mm -hmm. so that one doesn't even work. So when I say fake it till you be become it, they don't mind that it doesn't rhyme. <laughs> and, the, and they're willing to go, they, they don't have an idea of what fake it till you make it even means. Mm -hmm. So the, I get to actually, the, the good thing is that that allows me to explain it. They don't have a, 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 a sort of preconception about what that means. Mm -hmm. So I can explain it's really about um, tricking yourself into feeling confident enough to be yourself in the next moment. That's really what it comes down to. And so I do talk a lot about, about uh, you know, cultural differences, um, you know, obviously influence who you are. And it's, it's if, if, if that's part of uh, your authentic self, tricking yourself into feeling confident enough to be that self is, is, is absolutely fine. So I don't feel like, I, you know, I, I have heard from people from over 100 countries and I and I know you you've you've gotten e email like this too. Um, it does seem to translate. People find ways to personalize it, and I I, I think it's a little bit like um, you know your favorite song uh, or a popular song that many people love. It means something different to each person, and so when people hear that, as long as they understand the basic idea that sort of tricking yourself into feeling confident enough for that moment to to be free and be yourself they personalize it and make it meaningful to themselves. So it, it has translated, uh, honestly, better than I would have expected it to. Yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised because I think that, I mean, we're all tribal animals, right? That, that's just who we are. So this question of how to be within a tribe yep. is salient no matter what culture you're coming from. Yep. Let me just, one more thing about culture that, that reminded me of something you said uh, uh, earlier. We had this one exec ed program um, that was, I mean, so some of the executive education programs are, are put together by com companies, so they're custom programs, and so they'll send, you know, 100 employees. And one of them was a Chinese company. And, you know, the, the model in the exec ed program is the same as the MBA program, although they're not graded, but participation, is, it's case, you read a case, you discuss the case in class. That's how it works. Yeah. So for the first three days, it was a week-long program, no one was talking in class mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And no one knew, the professors did not know what to do. <laughs> and they, they were, you know, the, the, the administration contacted the CEO of the company and found out that the CEO had told them, you are at Harvard, do not speak. <laughs> Listen, like, it is not your, yeah. it, it is yeah. not appropriate for you to speak. And so, they had to, had to ask him to let them know it is okay to speak, mm -hmm. and so then. It, but, but yeah, again, the sort of the idea that participation is so is so uh, revered and sort of celebrated here. It, it's not everywhere. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. not. It's not the same all over the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny. If, um, for Quiet, I actually spent a lot of time in a largely Asian community based out in Silicon Valley, and I was talking with people of all different ages. And um, one of the things I learned is that many of <laughs> the men of this community who are business people were starting to accept jobs in Asia and they were commuting back and forth between Asia and the US because they were finding that in the US there was the bamboo ceiling that had, they felt so much to do with the fact that their own preference for reticence 
was seen as a, you know, an insurmountable handicap. So they would go back and have these great leadership positions in Asia. Um, you know, I think, gosh, like, now that companies are so, everything is so multinational, we've got to kind of bridge that understanding. That reminds me of what, one last question. Yeah. There's a, there's a new book by um, a, a writer named Dan Lyons named Disrupted. Has anyone read oh, this? Right. Can you clap if you've read it? <laughs> Disrupted, very, re really interesting book about this sort of the Silicon Valley culture, the startup mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. He's an older, he's, he's actually not, he's in his early 50s, a science journalist for many years at Newsweek. He loses that job and goes to work at a startup in Cambridge mm -hmm. and that's like Silicon Valley. Yeah. And the book is a lot about ageism in, yeah. in, in that yeah. culture. But, but the other part of it is this like idea that your whole social life is at work oh, yeah. and you're supposed to be so psyched all the time because it's super awesome. Yeah. Everything is super <laughs> awesome. Like three exclamation points. Yeah. And yeah. you know, everything is, is, and they have ping pong and they've got like Nerf gun battles and you're supposed to be doing all those things. Like there's a, there's a, there's a beer keg and, you know, and he just was like, he, he, he's pretty clearly an introvert. And, and, but, and so I think he felt out of place and that maybe it was generational. And I, I was reading it and I've talked to him about it too. And I think half the people there feel that way. Oh yeah. Half, yeah. I mean, they could be 26 and they're feeling that way. So th this, what do you, I mean, this, what do you think about this sort of startup culture and the, your whole social life is here and it's okay that you work all the time because we have beer and we'll get, get it catered and they have a candy wall. Yeah. We have a candy wall and you can bring your dogs here. So no, it's okay. I, mean, I think it's crazy. I think it's part of the reason that Silicon Valley is starting in some ways to lose some of its soul because of, of the importation of this kind of culture. Because many of the people who founded Silicon Valley and who still are working there as you say, are not oriented that way I know, at all. I, I mean, I interviewed of it, tons right? of them for, for my book and they would talk about that exactly that paradox. Um, and it's, you know, it's funny, I'm thinking about how Quiet Revolution, the organization that I started is exactly, is so much the opposite. So last year at holiday season, it was like December 23rd and we suddenly realized that we hadn't planned a holiday party, like it hadn't occurred to us. And, and we sort of looked at each other and we were like, does anyone want a holiday party? Does anyone want to do that? No. I no. So. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. So, you so know, don't have other to. cultures can exist. <laughs> And, and right, so, so what about, I mean, so in, in this place, and I think, and I, I don't even need to name it because I think it's representative of so many other places. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone has oh, yeah. to do Cinco de Mayo and everybody, it is Cinco de Mayo, by the way, but, but like they've got to celebrate and dress, they have to, to bring in Mexican food and it's all this, you know, and then everyone has to dress up for Halloween, everyone. Yeah. And if yeah. you don't, you're, you know, you're not really a team player. Yeah. Um, what do you... <laughs> Even when you get fired, they call it graduation. And so the next day, when that guy is missing, they say, Jim graduated, we all wish him well, but he's just gone. Like he's just gone from the desk is empty, Jim has graduated. So it all has to be like this positive social thing. What do you say to, to millennials who want to work in these places? They want to learn, I mean, they want to work in the startup world and they feel like I can't, I can't deal with, like I cannot cope with this because I think what happens is that they start to feel like, am I supposed to be super happy and cheerful all the time? Is there something wrong with me? What, what do you say to them about, about how to deal in those cultures? Can, can they I, work in those cultures? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's something very real. And I think that when you are evaluating a new job or a potential new job, you should be looking at those kinds of questions just as intently, if not more, um, as the way you would look at the salary and the benefits and all those more traditional indicators yeah. of whether it's right for you. Yeah. I mean, this stuff really matters for every ounce of your day. Right. And you know, and it is true that what you're describing is endemic in startup culture for sure. But it doesn't characterize every company. No. You know, okay. like I'm thinking of one um, uh, company where I, I did some research. It was a game, a, a company of game developers, and it was full of introverts, and they were really comfortable there, and the management was really cool and was always trying to think about how to make their developers happy. You know, so I think alternatives do exist. 
Um, Dave Eggers, by the way, wrote a really great dystopian novel called The Circle, ah. uh, which was a real critique okay. of this kind of culture. So I, I, I actually believe because of these kinds of critiques that are starting to emerge it's, it's that the pendulum changing. will Yeah, will, I think so too. Back. I think so yeah. too. Um, any last thoughts that you want to share? Um, you know, we talk so much about, I mean, you and I have talked so much about how these things but what, what both of us are doing apply to kids. Yeah. I just, yeah. Are there any, are, you know, any messages to the kids who might be listening? Yeah, I don't know. Just like, um, I don't know. We love you so much. And I, <laughs> so really, like the next generation of introverts really needs to know its own strengths. And so everything that we can do to make that happen. Great. Thank you so much for being here.